We're here with Susan Cartier-Liebel, founder of Solo Practice University, an online community for lawyers who are looking to go solo. Last week we prepared for this visit by asking our readers at abajournal.com to weigh in with their concerns and questions about going solo. And specifically, we ask them, what's holding you back from going solo? Such, it's always such a uh, hot topic on our site and, and other sites that I see. Uh, and so it wasn't a surprise when we asked the question that we got more than 50 responses. And, um, but we picked five for you to address today. So you didn't have to go through the, the whole list. Uh, and the first one comes from JN, who believes that it takes a certain type of person to go solo. And I wanted to ask you if it does, and if there are certain characteristics well, for a solo practitioner. I think first, people think that if you're going to go solo, it's because you don't have a problem with risk that you, you know, you jump forward, that you're some kind of, you know, rebel, okay, that's just going to, you know, leap into it and not care about anything. That's not true. People who go solo are not afraid, I mean, aren't, you know, um, these huge risk takers. They analyze the opportunities and opportunity cost. Um, yes, are there people that are born entrepreneurs and a legal education is just a means for them to create their own business and they're going to create their business no matter what? Absolutely. But I don't think there's one specific type of personality. I think some people back into solo practice and discover things about themselves they never realized. I think there's people that knew it all along mm -hmm. and I think there's people that did a cost-benefit analysis and said this makes perfect sense to me. Our next question comes from Tim. Uh, who believes you shouldn't go solo until you have the book of business to take with you. Until then, he says, work for a firm, get practice, and build up your reputation. And I wanted you to respond to that. With all due respect to Tim, that sounds great if you're coming from a big law firm with a book of business, that the economy isn't what it is, that you didn't just graduate from law school, that jobs are aplenty. Then it makes good sense as an option. But the economy that we're in, the fact that there is no book of business, you have to create your own, that there are no jobs to get your feet wet in, creates a circular logic and it's defeating. Because if there's no job for me to get mentorship in and learn and get my feet wet and to build a book of business, and that's what I'm supposed to be doing, then I'm left with nothing to do. Mm -hmm. Because I'm being told by the profession and, by, and capitalizing upon my own fears that I'm stuck. There's nothing I can do. And that kind of person who buys into that is the person who's going to rail against their legal education because they're going to feel trapped and helpless. Going up to the next question from Stephen, uh, and I see this a lot too uh, in comments about going solo, this, this seems like a common belief that the key to having to going solo is having a niche practice. Going solo can be a great opportunity if you have the right type of practice. And I wanted to ask you if you need a niche or if you can generalize. I think the most important thing right now is to define what a niche is. People think, oh, a niche is I'm just going to do real estate law or I'm just going to do personal injury law. That's not a niche. A niche is much bigger than that. A niche can be for dramatic you know, for dramatic emphasis, let's say, someone who's been in the military, who's familiar with military families, and their focus is a demographic niche. And I'm only going to work with the military because that's the community I'm comfortable with. And then dealing with the military people, it could be divorce and real estate and personal injury. The niche is the demographic. So you don't want to just say, you know, I'm just doing real estate to whomever comes in the door to do real estate transactions. The same way people also define niche is let's take real estate. Real estate is so broad, you can have a practice area that has a niche within it, short sales or just foreclosures, and build a niche that way. So I think the most important thing you have to understand is niche isn't simply a defined practice area or a small segment of it. It can be a demographic niche. That uh, leads nicely into the next question uh, and concern, which comes from Letty, who finds the whole prospect of building that business daunting. Um, more debt, staffing, setting rates, all of the business aspects of going solo. When you're starting to practice today, you've got to realize there are technologies in place where literally you could be traveling and go to your smartphone and have access to all your files, your communications, your accounting, all of these things. It's done what's called in the cloud, where you are accessing your entire office you know, in the ether mm -hmm. at a minimal monthly cost. And once you understand that, that there is organizations and companies that are creating support 
outside that you don't have to have that physical overhead. You don't have to have staff and you can have virtual assistants, remote assistants who help you on an as needed basis. It doesn't have to be daunting. What's, what's daunting to her is the fear of the unknown until she gets educated on the realities of how you can practice today. And again, good segue into the, our final question from Lex, who uh, wanted you to talk about mentors and um, specifically how to find appropriate mentors who have their own practices to feed, especially as uh, he was it, a part-time student who never had the advantage of clerking because he already had a full-time job. One of the most important things in understanding, because I experienced this as well, when I got out of law school and opened up a practice with two other people, I thought, no one is going to help me because, you know, I, I perceived myself as competition. I was just one more lawyer coming into a saturated market, and therefore, who's going to want to help me? Until I understood a couple of things. As a new lawyer, no matter what you're doing, you come out with a, a actually a book of business you don't recognize it because every person it can be said knows 250 people in their sphere of influence from the very intimate to the touching and so that person is going to already have this book of business even though they don't know how to cultivate it yet so when a new lawyer says oh you know uh, Molly um, Molly says, I just opened a practice, but I don't do real estate. I'd like to establish a relationship with you so that if, you know, something like this comes across, I can refer it to you. Lawyers are, as a group, I have found, it doesn't even matter their motivations. They're going to work with you and help you because there's something in it for them as well. Whether it's their ego, they're looking to get, you know, educated um, or, or to, to give off their education or share their education or they're looking to find new referral sources from new lawyers who have business that they can't necessarily handle and will refer it to them, they're there for you. Mm -hmm. So I was pleasantly surprised, right down to motion work. Um, I, I got comfortable to the point where I was calling up people and saying, do you have a motion for this, do you have a motion for that? And they'd shoot it over. So the mentors are there. The other thing you have to realize is that you're not coming to the party empty-handed. You have gifts to offer. You have potential referrals, you have your enthusiasm, you have, you know, a desire to work, and you have to create a plan that's going to make it attractive to people to want to be associated with you. But you can't do it if you're sitting there believing, I've got nothing to offer, I have no experience, I have no people, I don't know what I'm doing. That's self-defeating, and that's something you're going to have to start dealing with and recognizing about yourself, that you do have things to offer. And to wrap up, I wanted, because you've been doing this for a while and because you're out there with Solo Practice University, you're getting a lot of feedback and, and seeing what the concerns are. What's kind of the number one thing uh, that, that people tell you um, causes them to, to hold back and not go solo? Fear. Absolutely fear. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. Fear of the unknown. The fear the profession lays on them really thick. You're a malpractice case waiting to happen. You don't know what you're doing. You're not going to serve your clients. Everyone telling you that you're inept, you don't have the education. It's not true. Yeah, are there people out there that shouldn't be practicing solo? Absolutely. But they also shouldn't be working in law firms because they're still not going to know what they're doing. We do churn out way too many lawyers, and we don't necessarily give them the education they need. But for the person who wants to go solo, They've got to get over the fear by learning there is, really isn't that much to be as fearful as they, uh, to be fearful of as they think they have to be fearful of. Boy, that was a sentence. Um, and to also, <laughs> and to also understand they do have capabilities. Uh, it, we, we beat them into this submission that they feel like as soon as they graduated law school, they're newborns and wet behind the ears and, and they need to be, you know, Molly Kyle, that, that, that's not the case. They're real, fully functioning people that had a life, that have connections, that have smarts, that brought in a law degree as an extra skill set to effectuate change and to advocate for others. They didn't just all of a sudden become a blank slate. And I think we've got to stop the profession from beating down on these people and saying, you don't know anything, you're going to create problems for people, you're going to get disbarred. That serves nobody. So that's, those are the two things. Thank you so much for talking to us. Tom. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for coming.